Hello, and welcome to this evening's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Eric Siegel. I'm chair of the club's personal growth forum and your host. We invite everyone to visit us online at commonwealthclub.org for a complete listing of all Commonwealth Club events and to register for any of our events. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Dr. Justin Garcia, Executive Director of the Kinsey Institute and the Ruth N. Halls Professor of Gender Studies at Indiana University. And since 2010, he's also been scientific advisor to Match.com. Justin has a doctorate in evolutionary biology, and his research program focuses on the evolutionary and biocultural foundations of romantic and sexual relationships throughout life. With his colleagues, he studied variation in monogamy, intimacy, gender, courtship, dating, desire, satisfaction, and reproductive strategies. His research has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, CNN, National Geographic, and many other outlets. He served as the executive director of the Kinsey Institute since 2019, and he's co-author of Evolution and Human Sexual Behavior, published by the Harvard University Press. His next book is titled, The Intimate Animal. Please welcome Dr. Garcia to our podium. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and thank you, everyone. I'm so delighted and honored uh, to be here tonight. Uh, so what I thought I would do is start a little bit, um, to give a little bit of background about the Kinsey Institute, where my lab is, where our uh, research stems from, the types of questions we ask and why. And then I want to tell you a little bit about some of our current research programs, particularly our Singles in America project. Uh, and then from there, I think we'll open up for a discussion. So I'm looking forward to any questions. I know Eric's got some for me and any others that come in. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about what we're learning about people's intimate lives today and why it is that our intimate lives are such a great connector. It is the, the great human universal um, when we think about love and sex, whether it's because you pursue it, because you want to talk about it, you're afraid to talk about it, you're uncomfortable. The messiness of our intimate lives are something that connects people all over the globe, not just in terms of reproductive motives, um, but also our pursuit of love, intimacy, sex, and sometimes our fears around them. So I'll take a step back first and describe a little bit where my lab, my laboratory is based um, at Indiana University at the Kinsey Institute. And the Institute was formed in uh, 1947. It was first founded, uh, initially called the Institute for Sex Research. Uh, and today we're named after our founder, Dr. Alfred C. Kinsey, who was a zoologist at Indiana University. He started his career studying gall wasps, uh, the type small insect, uh, as a taxonomist and wanted to really look at different behaviors and uh, look at different morphologies and what were these wasps, why did they vary, where did they vary? But he then applied those same techniques to looking at people's intimate lives, their sexual lives. So Dr. Kinsey and colleagues in the 1940s and 50s conducted still to this day one of the most ambitious studies looking at human sexuality. They interviewed over 18,000 people. They were in-person interviews. They lasted from three to 18 hours. Uh, if they were that long, they were broken up over multiple days and really tried to understand people's sexual lives. And there was a lot of things that we learned. There were a lot of things that America learned about that massive study to try and explore the sex lives of people um, from all different, different demographics uh, across, across the country, across educational background, race, religion, um, and all sorts of other demographic factors. Uh, in many ways, the study was really trying to understand the role of sex in people's lives. And before Kinsey, there had been some work here and there, but nothing really as focused and as expansive. And that's a legacy we still try to continue today. Now, interestingly, in the 40s, uh, so this, the first interviews were happening as um, early as the late 1930s. So we can think about that particular historical time uh, in, the, in America and worldwide. And what was shifting in terms of gender roles, in terms of sexuality, and what was so explosive about Kinsey's early studies was just that someone was willing to talk about sexuality and do it in a systematic, scientific way. And that approach is still at the core of what we do in our research today. We really say, how do we think of sexuality in this way that we can 
respect people's lives when we talk about its aspects, but in this really careful, systematic, scientific uh, approach. So at the Institute today, we actually have, there's nine different laboratories that contribute to some of the things we're gonna talk about tonight. And they look at uh, different aspects of people's sexual lives. We have a, lot, a folk group focused on sexual violence. We have a sexual violence research initiative. We have a group that looks at condom use and misuse. Uh, my own lab with uh, my colleague, Dr. Amanda Gesselman, looks at people's romantic and sexual lives. Um, so we can think of all these different pieces and how sex feeds into that, how that, um, the challenges, the highs and the lows. And one of the things we've learned over the years is that, uh, in fact, even though we don't always want to talk about it, sex has a big impact on our lives and our well-being. For instance, we might talk about uh, marriage and what keeps marriages and families together. But what we don't spend enough talking about is people's sex lives in those marriages. One of the things the studies at the Institute and elsewhere have showed is that people's sex lives are one of the strongest predictors of what keeps relationships satisfied and what keeps marriages together. So although we're quick to talk about marriage dissolution and conflict in people's relationships, and we might talk about the economy and finances and family complexities and where you're living, too often, we don't address what's really at the core. What we know statistically in all the studies is a factor, and that's people's sexual lives. So what we really try and do at the Kinsey Institute, what we try and do in the studies I'm gonna talk about um, throughout this evening with Eric and with you all, is the role of sex, the role of relationships, what, we're, what we can learn about how we communicate, when we communicate, um, and how that shapes our well-being. We know that people's intimate lives has, have a remarkable impact on our overall psychological and physical well-being. Uh, one of my Kinsey colleagues who studies oxytocin, Sue Carter, uh, refers to it as a neuropeptide, a molecule that's involved in sexual activity, but also in bonding. Um, sometimes we hear about oxytocin in terms of um, uh, maternal uh, bonding with, uh, with babies, right? particularly it's involved in breastfeeding and milk letdown. It's also involved in birthing. It's also involved in the physiology of organs. So we know that this peptide can impact our connections. Well, it turns out that what Sue's work has found is that it's also involved in our immune function. So when you kind of joke about love being the best medicine, turns out there's a physiological basis to that. And we know that our relationships, we can sync with other partners when, when we rise in the morning, when we go down for sleep at night, that impacts our life and our well-being. Whether our partner reminds us to take our vitamins or take our medication, studies have shown they do that. It's an important feature of what our partnerships help with, that that can impact our well-being. Our overall psychological happiness, the impact on things like loneliness. As many of you know, the US Surgeon General has declared a loneliness epidemic in the United States. And actually, countries throughout Europe and Asia are likewise demonstrating high rates of psychological loneliness and the impact on our psychological and physical well-being. So when I think about the role of why the Kinsey Institute needs to exist today, why we have to keep asking questions about our romantic and sexual lives, I often think about our founder, Dr. Kinsey, and he said once that the reason we had to do these scientific studies to have some evidence around our romantic and sexual lives was to provide some light in the darkness. And I think that's still important. I know tonight we're gonna to talk about the sort of post-pandemic era, and uh, if, if we can call it that, and how uh, our romantic and sexual lives look a little bit different. And part of that, I think, is, is again providing that light. Um, I think about the studies we started doing during the pandemic. So at the Institute, we did one of the largest multinational studies on the impact of COVID on people's romantic and sexual lives. I remember we were collecting data really early on, um, a few different studies, and looking at what those impacts were. And the questions we were getting asked is, is it okay to kiss my spouse? Is it okay to go on dates? How should we connect if we can't go out in person anymore? And how we've sort of fumbled through that. Turns out what our research has found that on average, the impact of the pandemic was, at least initially, we saw a decline in sexual frequency, a decline in the quality of people's sexual lives. 
on average. But we also found that in those people that were declining in their activities, about one in five were trying something new. So it took this pandemic, it was the first time some people turned to their partners and said, have you ever wanted to try this? Have we ever so, um, thought about you know, a new behavior or a new activity or using a toy? So we had this decline in frequency, but an expansiveness in what people were willing to try and experience. Uh, and it turns out that that expansiveness is actually quite valuable to long-term relationships. Um, the, it's actually what psychologists call the expansion of self, a phenomena that often in couples, um, our partners help us see and experience the world in new ways. And, and it's something that's quite important for long-term relationship satisfaction. So we know that the pandemic had these immediate impacts. One way I like to think about it is that, um, as, a bio, as Eric said, I'm a biologist by training, an evolutionary biologist, and I often think, you know, we would never see two gazelle mate in front of a lion. And for so many of us, the pandemic was that lion. It was this threat that we feel, we felt, that we experienced. And we felt it in a, in a physiological way. Our bodies went into threat response. We were afraid. But in some ways, that's the whole reason we have relationships. The human animal has been forming intense pair bonds for over four million years. People all over the world form intense love bonds. And the very purpose, the reason they evolved is to weather the storm. So one of the things that I found so interesting was that despite being in this terrifying time for so many of us, that our relationships, and that extends to also close friendships and, and not just romantic partnerships, but they are what got us through that hard time. That's why they, the part of their function, their evolutionary function was to get through uncertainty. And one of the things that my colleagues and I have argued. So I think for many people, it turns that looking at our relationships became a source of creativity, of stability, of our own grounding and well-being. And it turns out that in another one of our studies that our Kinsey Institute colleagues did, that most marriages, I remember early on, journalists kept calling and asking, well, what's the impact going to be? Are we going to see a baby boom in nine or 10 months? Are we going to see um, uh, more divorces? Are we going to see, what do we know? When it turns out that on all of those things, we've had predictions. We didn't expect a baby boom. It turns out that demographers have studied that phenomena. And you do expect a baby boom when there's something that's uh, kind of a small stressor. So it turns out if there's a, a tropical storm or a hurricane warning, demographers have shown the baby boom about nine to 10 months later. But if there's a full-blown tornado or hurricane, you don't see that baby boom. And it's been studied in other ways. So for instance, after the Oklahoma City bombings, there was a baby boom nine to 10 months later. But there wasn't one after September 11th in New York and other places in the, in the country. So if it's an intense threat, you don't see it, but a small threat. And COVID, for so many people, was an intense threat. It was too big. So we didn't see that boom afterwards. So as people were processing that, though, my colleagues also asked, what about marriages? How is your marriage lasting? Now, for some people, it got worse. If you were in an abusive relationship, one characterized by a lot of hostility and conflict. But overall, most Americans, close to 85%, we've demonstrated that their marriages have gotten better over time, that particularly through the pandemic. And I think there's something really remarkable there. There's a lesson for all of us there, that it took this, this existential life threat, people dying in the world around us, for so many to turn to their partners and to appreciate the power, the magnitude of those relationships, of those bonds to make us feel safe, to help us weather those storms. So I'm also inspired by our research findings. I'm actually quite optimistic about this time that we're in after the pandemic for the power of relationships to sort of get through those difficult storms. And I think for many people, particularly in the United States, there's been a rethinking of how we prioritize those relationships. Uh, in fact, as, as Eric knows, and um, some of you might know, early in my career, I uh, used to write and think a lot more about hookup culture and casual sex. My core interests were always around monogamy, and I was interested in those cases where people were deviating from monogamy. So consensually non-monogamous relationships, uh, hookups, uh, casual sex, infidelity, all the variations of monogamy as it, as it happens. And um, one of the things that we're seeing now is actually somewhat lower interest rates in things like hookups and casual sex. So in the data, 
And when I say that, uh, one of the big studies we've been doing is since 2010 with Match.com, we've been doing a study called Singles in America. So every year we survey over 5,000 US singles. It's a national demographically representative study. So it's not people on a dating app. We go, go use a third party data collection firm to get a sample of singles. Now each year, now for 13 years, we get a different wave of singles. So we're able to get a sense of some of the things of how people are interacting and what people are looking for in their romantic and sexual lives. And we've asked about things like casual sex and dating and forming relationships. And what we've seen is that on average, there seems to be a little less interest in things like hooking up and casual sex and a little more interest in finding partners that make people feel safe and secure. Even the very things that people look for in their relationships, I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, has changed over the last few years. So it's really a remarkable time. Um, and in our single study, we've looked at all sorts of different uh, things over the years, and we published a series of academic articles from it. And it can really help inform how we think about who singles are. So you might be asking, why do we do this study with Match? In the United States today, there's over 100 million single American adults, well over a third of the adult population, moving in and out of romantic and sexual relationships throughout the adult life course. So we've been really interested in how that population is impacting culture and norms about dating and relationships. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting things there, including trends that are um, challenging what we thought we knew about social and behavioral sciences. Um, I'll give one quick example, and then I think maybe we'll move to a conversation. Um, I often think about intergenerational transmission, particularly in courtship and relationships. We learn things from our parents and our grandparents about what we think intimate life should be like, public displays of affection, marital norms. Um, but one of the things we're seeing now is, is a reverse pattern, where young people are telling their parents and their grandparents who are increasingly using dating apps and websites how to connect with each other. Uh, I think it's really an interesting pattern. The young are, 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 are ushering in new norms about connection and dating, um, as we see those over 100 million adults on the dating market. A lot of that has to do with the way we're using technology. And the way we're using technology has changed in many ways since the pandemic because we've had to rely on it in so many ways. Even this evening, being able to be on um, a, a teleconference with, uh, with each other. It's changed from years and decades past. And as an evolutionary biologist, it's so interesting to me because it's changed from millions of years past. Well, I probably said enough to get us started, but that's a little bit of the context of the kind of project that, uh, that we work on, the types of data we, we talk about, but we have dozens of studies in any given year looking at different aspects of people's romantic and sexual lives. So I'm happy to share some of that with you today, but I think Eric's gonna join me and we'll move, move it into a conversation to talk about some of that. All right. <laughs> Thank you. And those of you who or watching online, uh, send in your questions. They'll show up on my, my iPhone here. But I'd like to just start off by talking a bit about, you know, this world of digital flirting, really. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the, the worries I would have, when we talk, you talked a bit about loneliness and a loneliness pandemic, mm -hmm. is, you know, we all know that digital life doesn't seem to go away. Once you say something, it's out there forever. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you know, as I was when I, when I was a kid, if you did something foolish, you know, in a year, no one remembered. Mm -hmm. Now it's etched in stone. And so has this somehow affected the way that people talk to each other digitally on match or whatever? Mm -hmm. What they write down, you know, they, I've heard that the 20-somethings want to edit what they say very carefully. They don't want to meet in person. They want to, you know, edit it, send you an email, send you a text. Mm -hmm. So what are you seeing about that? Are they all going to become avoidant? <laughs> to avoid seeing each other in person? Yeah, it's, I, I love this. And I think there's so many different layers there that we can build on and unpack. 
And what we see is that uh, for, for young people, but also for, for people of all ages, is with sort of the way that we're using technology more. Um, and I'll start with the first part, this idea that we, we send messages and then it's there. There's screenshots of the chat, there's the things you said. Um, I think there's two parts of that. On the one hand, we're actually seeing people sometimes be a little bit more careful in terms of what they say and what they don't. Um, uh, particularly, we actually have some data that we've been looking at in terms of sexual harassment mm -hmm. and what's changed in since the Me Too movement. In our study, 51% of men said the Me Too movement changed their behavior in dating and, in, and work. So sometimes it's things like that. Um, and a different type of accountability. So we did a study on some people know from, uh, if you've been on dating apps, um, men that will send often nude images of themselves, uh, particularly heterosexual men to women, mm -hmm. and often unsolicited. Right. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm not a prude as a, as a sexologist, but I think there is a place that if people want to, if, if consenting adults want to share images with each other, I think that's fine. But the idea of it being, um, unsolicited and many, in some ways non-consensual to receive that photo, that's where the problem is. That's where we can see um, it, you know, sexual harassment, arguably, um, or, or not arguably, depending on your, on your approach. So we, uh, that's been one case. That's sort of been one challenging on, on one part of it. And those images stay. So also making people think about how they can be more careful. But then there's another piece of that. And that you're right. We're seeing particularly in young people, they want to start with a text message. They want to think about it. They want to see what they're saying. Um, often you do that before phone calls. Although we're starting to see in some of the data after the pandemic, people are now going back to, they want to check in on a phone call or a FaceTime video or a Skype video, whatever, uh, Zoom, whatever your platform is to, to try and connect. And one of the things we saw during COVID was a rise of video dating. And what was really interesting is just by happenstance, we had happened to ask about video dating a few years before. And what we found is that most people weren't really that interested in doing it. But then with the pandemic, it was sort of by uh, necessity, people were doing it. And it looks like it's actually stayed. And I'm convinced it's going to stay for a while. But I think the reason is not necessarily because people don't want to meet in person or IRL in real life, as, as, uh, um, as my students would say. And what I think is happening is that video dating, it, it's safer for a lot of people. It's cheaper. It's less time investment, less financial investment. It's um, one of the things our participants will say. It's a vibe check. It's a way to get to see, you know, do, do you have any kind of chemistry with this person? So. Now, to your point, though, Eric, I don't think that's a, a long-term strategy. You can't, um, for some, maybe, but most don't want to do video dating forever. But I think it's a new step in the courtship process, that you start texting, you video chat, um, then you eventually meet in person. And the challenge for some people is moving into that then move meeting in person. And then the human brain does the stuff it's done for millions of years. Yeah, with the video dating, you would get to see the other person's environment. Yeah. More than you never, you, you couldn't see that before. You could talk to them on the phone, mm -hmm. and then you would meet them maybe in a club or at a, you know at a bar or a restaurant. But you, with a video date, I suppose you can see their home. You can see you know their dog. You can see mm -hmm. you know if they have kids or whatever. It gives you more of an idea of who this person is by the way they've chosen to surround themselves. By. Yeah. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And for, as a biologist, I'm always interested, what is the sensory information we're getting when we're mm. in the courtship process? And in person, you might smell someone. You might really hear their voice tone. Mm -hmm. You might see their full body uh, type and size and how they move and their body language. Those are all things that we know are important in the courtship process. But exactly, on a video chat with someone in their home, you learn all these other things about their dress, about the artwork on their walls, about the size of their home, about the, the pets in their home. Turns out pets, we did a study, pets are important in dating <laughs> and courtship as well. And a lot of people with pets treat them uh, somewhat similarly to single parents, that the opinion of your dog and cat is important. So we found non-negligible numbers of people that say, if my dog or cat doesn't like you, you're in trouble. So, so this is a new form of dating that's coming out of digital life and the pandemic life mm -hmm. is people have learned how to do a video chat, I suppose. Yeah. And, and now part of the trick will be, okay, let's keep moving into real life. And is, is there, are you finding a glitch there? They'll do the video chat and then they'll kind of vanish. They don't want to, real life shows up. It's, uh, I'm a little worried about that. <laughs> I've got no practice in that for three years. Mm -hmm. 
how about if I just disappear? I mean, what do you see? Yeah. Well, what's interesting, we had uh, rates of that we were seeing in the data beforehand, that people would start chatting and didn't always move, particularly on apps and websites. And just to take one step back, we know that apps and websites are now the most common way that singles are meeting their partners. Mm -hmm. So uh, close to 50% of singles in the US last year met their last, most recent first date through an app or a website, compared to 6% in a bar. So historically, places like bars or church or school uh, were common ways to connect. They're actually relatively low when we look at national data. And apps and websites, the sort of internet, or, or how people are meeting. And we could talk about whether it works well or not for some people, but that's how they're connecting. And there's always mm. been this challenging step of moving from that platform to then in person. And some people fizzle away. They get nervous. They don't have time. They forget about the chat. Um, and sometimes it's what some researchers call gamifying. So often you're on the apps and you can kind of treat it like a game you're playing on your phone. Oh. And then you forget that it's a real person you're interacting with. And then it's like, oh, we had to make plans to get together because you haven't quite activated those emotional feelings of this is a relationship, a budding potential relationship. So once you meet in person, that's when that, that sort of there's, psychobehavioral there's thing There's something activate. about seeing the person in person. Yeah, we're a social mammal, and it sort of activates our, our, our being in a different way. Yeah, that brings up two other questions. I'll, <laughs> I'll, um, I think I'll, 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 I'll do one and then the other. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that a friend commented who uh, has a disability is that during the pandemic and with digital uh, communications, she was able to participate in talks like this, in social events, in parties, because they were all online. Mm -hmm. For the first time, she really felt that she was, in effect, an equal with everybody. There wasn't a special arrangement mm -hmm. that had to be made. What happens now? Are people maybe more aware of the fact they could have a hybrid uh, you know, party or whatever, mm -hmm. might meet somebody? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to snap back to the way it was? I mean, are you seeing any data about this? Are you looking into how people with various disabilities you know, meet? Yeah, I love that you uh, are bring this up. Um, so actually, at the uh, interestingly, at the Kinsey Institute, we have a brand new re uh, research initiative, a new program um, called DASHI, the Disability and Sexual Health Initiative. It's oh, run by my okay. uh, colleagues, Dr. Bill Yarber and Dr. Jen Piat. And so they've been looking at how people with disabilities, it impacts their sexual health, their well-being and connections. And we've just started talking about a study um, where we sort of merged some of the questions in my lab group and their lab group on how are people with disabilities in particular engaging in the dating market? And when do they disclose those disabilities? Because yeah. it's a population that often has stigma uh, that they experience, particularly on the dating market. Yeah. And when do you say, well, maybe I want to keep, you know, maybe we can do video dating at first or because I want to be cautious about large crowds or I have mobility uh, challenges and how you disclose that and when you disclose that. And uh, it can be a challenge, particularly in dating. We know that when people are dating, there's so much stigma that happens. Mm -hmm. It's uh, um, in all sorts of ways. And one of the challenges with the technology is that we sometimes have a false sense that there's these unlimited opportunities. So we might go on and you say, well, but um, that person seems too tall. That person seems too fat. That person seems too silly. That person, their hair is too long. That person, they have no hair like me. You know, so we can start to discriminate for all these different reasons, um, whether they're disabilities, whether it's hair color, whether it's height, it's race, it's religion. And um, people do that. People will naturally discriminate. Psychologists have studied those biases. And what can happen is that in real life, though, we know that the things that actually matter in our relationships, um, you start to pull that out when you're in a face-to-face -face conversation. So for instance, we asked people in our study, what are the most important things to you in a new, in a new relationship? Mm -hmm. And things like physical abilities or psychological disabilities or looks, they're important. But it turns out there are five things that rise to the top in our studies, including, and I just looked at the data, we sometimes cut it by region. So looking at California, this is, it holds up here too. And the five most important things, it's not necessarily looks and disabilities and religion. Number one thing is um, someone you can trust and confide in. Uh, next is someone who's emotionally mature. 
Third is someone who can make you laugh, uh, which, I, which I just love every time I think of that. Laughter and humor in particular, because it's a sign often of emotional intelligence and being able to connect. The fourth one, which is great for us at Kidsy, is someone, who's confident, uh, um, someone who is confident discussing or to thinking about their sexuality. Mm -hmm. So sort of just um, knowing who you are and what you're interested in. And then the fifth one is someone who's able to communicate their needs and their wants. So when we look at those five things that are the most important when you're on the courtship uh, um, the market, we might call it, or if you're dating, it's really things about being kind of genuine of who you are and, and knowing that you know someone who you can laugh with and be honest with, that it's this give and take, that I know you're going to take care of me and then I can take care of you and we're going to be honest and authentic with each other. Um, we can be vulnerable with each other. Those rise to the top as things that people are looking for um, when, they're, when they're dating and mating. It has nothing to do with how tall you are mm -hmm. or whether you're between the ages of 27 and 28, <laughs> but not 29 mm -hmm. or, or something like that. And exactly. that, that brings us to the, again, the electronic dating and the mm -hmm. filtering mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So is it possible? It seems to me that by allowing people to filter mm -hmm. by these really fine grained uh, distinctions, they lose the, ch the chance of going to a party, mm -hmm. you know, and there are 25 people and you run into somebody and you, just, you strike it off and, and they're not at all the kind of person you would think you would enjoy by their height or their age or their, you know, appearance in some way. Mm -hmm. And yet some sort of chemistry happens. Mm -hmm. So how do we adjust that in the, in the modern world of digital dating? is the advice then to open up your filters, to try chatting with somebody, or is the hit rate so low that it doesn't really work well, even though theoretically it might? Yeah. I mean, what, what do you find? So one of the things dating coaches will often advise people, and partially drawn from data, studies like ours, is that if you, um, if you expand a little bit out, if you're too narrow, um, it actually can be a detriment. And sometimes if you're in a big city, you almost might, might want to be narrow because you think, oh, there's just, it's an overwhelming number of options. So people will sometimes narrow in. But you're right. Sometimes we think we know what we want in those cases and we can get really specific. And often it's times because people are playing with rules in their head and they say, well, because I don't want someone who's more than three years older than me, so I'm going to have this cutoff age. Or someone who has this kind of education or someone who has um, you know, this sort of background. But what we find is that when it comes to actual, so it's one of the things in the research, we make a distinction between what we call mating preferences, your partner preferences, who you might say you're looking for, those mm -hmm. search criteria, and then your actual mate choices, who are the real people that you pick. And there is a lot of overlap, but one of the things we find is it's, it's sort of on the edges. So if you say you want someone who's around your age, you probably are not gonna start a relationship with someone who's 20 years older or younger. But it might be that you would find yourself quite interested in someone who's maybe three or five or seven years of a difference. That there can be those expansions of those criteria that you have. So your preferences are helpful in terms of knowing your general lanes of where you want to be. But there's fuzziness around that when we actually start to meet people in all sorts of ways. And I think you're right that you, know, you might be at an event and you can kind of connect with someone or at a bar or at a party. Um, but there's also challenges to that of people getting over the fear of going up to someone, not knowing if they're single or if they're in a relationship. Mm. Um, so so the, what the apps and the websites help us do is go through the sea of people and say, well, who's on the market right now? Who's also interested? Um, and or do we have some traits? They're sort of, I like to think of them really as like connecting apps and sites, that they're a way to see who might be also interested in connecting and maybe starting a date. And then you have to move into that, who you really are and um, whether you can turn on your charm or whether you can kind of say things about you, uh, th things about me, things about you, where we have similars and, uh, similarities and interests and where we have differences. And sometimes those differences are good. I can experience new things about the world. And sometimes they're too much. Um, so uh, what, we, what we find is that um, people, people tend to be a little bit more narrow than they, than they necessarily should be or need to be uh, as they're out looking for um, 
potential partners because there are things. Now, one of my favorite stats in our study from last year, when I was looking back at our data last year, we found, so we asked about 5,000 singles in the US, we found that 49% said that um, they had, at some point in their life, uh, fallen in love with someone they weren't initially attracted to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a profound number. It's half of people, um, and not a very significant gender difference. It's half of people who have said that um, getting to know someone matters. It's uh, why my takeaway from that is second dates matter. <laughs> it is right. getting to know someone a little bit more because we can make those snap judgments. We all do. We naturally will make those snap judgments. But if there's something there, there's a there's a potential, a seed, a kernel of things that interest you about someone to explore that, to go on second dates, to get to know them. The data actually suggests that can be quite powerful. Yeah, so, you know, maybe a little texting, but very quickly moving to at least a video date. Mm -hmm. And then if there's any interest at all saying, wait a moment, well, let's take it to in real life mm -hmm. once or twice. Yeah. Uh, don't say, well, you know, it's only a small seed. I'm not going to, because there really might be something. Yeah, and, there's, and there could be so much there that it takes time. And one of the things People that I think... People have to be a little less nervous. You exactly. You, you nailed it. And one of the things that we all have to remember is that first dates are awkward. They're awkward for everyone. We can be nervous. We could be um, a little afraid. We could be unsure what to say, what not to say. It could have been a bad day at the office, too. Could, you yeah. Know? You're stressed. As, uh, we're judging each other often on, on any information we have. And you might mm -hmm. say, well, you were really nice, but you held your fork funny. Because we're looking at anything. <laughs> right, because we, we have no on. other information. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also one of the things that happens when you when one sets up a filter is that the other person can see that filter, right? You so you can you look at and say, well, the other person is being very narrower. I wouldn't. I really like this person, but I don't think they would like me because you can see that they've set their filter very narrowly. And so maybe it would be better not just for my own, you know, seeing a broader group, but to signal to other people that. You know, let's let's see. Let's let's give it a try. Does mm -hmm. does that make sense to set your filter broader for that reason? Uh, it depends a little bit on the platform. So some mm -hmm. platforms people are on that you if um, the people searching for you can see how you what your criteria mm -hmm. are, and some they can't. So it depends on. There's so many different apps and websites. And in fact, you bring up a, an important point. On average, people are on about three different apps or websites at a time. So often if you're on one, you're on several. Okay. And they have different flavors. And sometimes you're, maybe your pictures or your profile information is a little different on different ones. There's different demographics that use different kinds. So that's not uncommon um, and depends on what you're searching. But something you said also reminds me, it's I think uh, such an important principle of when we think about the science of connecting and dating mm -hmm. and what we've been learning from our studies of singles is that dating is always a two-way street. Yeah. And you might be out there searching and you say, here's what I'm looking for. This is, I know I want someone that has this. Um, and maybe you don't really fill out your profile or you don't have that many pictures or you're not that concerned because you're in search mode. You're out mm. there searching. But the thing we forget is that when you're in search mode looking, everyone out there is in search mode looking at you. So it's a dyadic process. It's a two-way street. It's not just the information that you're looking for. You have to provide enough information for everyone out there who's looking. So one of the best sort of data-informed pieces of advice we give people is make sure your, your profiles have some information about that, that something is to connect. Maybe it's pictures of, of you hiking. You go, oh my gosh, is that, are you in Machu Picchu? I've always wanted to go to Machu Picchu. What was it like? So something that someone can, can hook on to, you need to give people opportunities um, to engage with you. So you have to have enough information about who you are um, when you're out on that market. You have to share. It's the same, though, if you were in a bar. If you were in a bar and someone came up to you and was flirting with you and you don't open up and share anything, it's not going to go anywhere. So we have to do that on the platforms, too. So it's that two-way, both what you're looking for yeah. and giving people things to opportunities to, to discover about you. Yeah, so having that, the presentation that you make to others, to interest them, to come up with a topic of conversation so mm -hmm. it's a little less awkward when you're talking, and having a, a reasonably broad mm -hmm. uh, profile that's not so broad that you've invited in <laughs> all of New York City, but, <laughs> but is not so narrow that you discourage other people and you discourage yourself from something that might happen spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And how, even for people who have a disability, this now becomes more possible than it was five, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. because 
there can be groups, there can be, and it, are there like group dating kind of things where, where the app will let you meet with a group of five or 10 people? Does, does that exist or could that exist? Uh, it's interesting you raised that. One of the things we see in younger generations in particular is often group dating. So I don't know of a platform that uh, necessarily encourages that. There are some platforms that your friends can weigh in and you can have you can ask people oh, for okay. opinions. And we know that people do that. They'll show, uh, they'll send screenshots or they'll show their apps. Say, what do you think of this person? What about that person? Um, but young people in particular do this sort of um, process of getting to know each other. It's what my colleague Helen Fisher will refer to as slow love. And mm -hmm. it's this, uh, they kind of hang out for several weeks mm -hmm. or months, and it's often in groups. And you say, well, are they dating? They've never really been one-on-one -on -one for the first few weeks or months. So we see this way of kind of hanging out and getting to a getting to know you phase and you're hanging out and you're sometimes with groups and then maybe you're dating for weeks or months and then maybe you're in a relationship for weeks or months and then you're in uh, uh, a serious relationship and then maybe you're engaged, maybe you're cohabiting. So we're extending this period. And just a few generations ago, not just a few decades ago, that wasn't done. Uh, no, people would often marry fairly, fairly early on when they met. And in some ways, marriage was the start of this great uh, expedition together, a journey together. For young people, particularly today, and actually increasingly all ages, but particularly for the young, marriage is the, is the grand finale. They do it after they've been know, getting to know each other. They want to know everything about someone um, before they get married. So it's a very different pattern. So Helen and I have well, written Google about Google is it. suddenly yeah. really important. <laughs> right. Slow love, she called it. Yeah, I, I heard it called a situationship. <laughs> situationship, that's one, yeah. <laughs> that, that, those early stages of really not having clear uh, definitions of what it is you're doing. Yeah, we got one question that came in was, um, I mean, are you looking at at long-term relationships and how conflict resolution is a part of that. Has any of that, mm -hmm. um, is there some way in which the pandemic or digital technology has shifted the way people relate to one another in long-term relationships? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so we have, so the study on marriage uh, that was led by uh, some, of my, some of my Kinsey Institute colleagues, um, they found, so as I mentioned, that overall marriages were doing uh, better after, in the pandemic. Um, but we know that people were, at the same time, there was also sometimes too much of each other, right? So if you had a kind of conflict that could feel like it went on all day, because it was like, well, where do you go? How do you, where do you go for your walk or to go get a cup of coffee to right. kind of right. separate? Now, now that things have opened up again, um, the, one of the questions is, and it's a good question, and we don't really know is, have we developed some skills? So when we talk, we often think about, well, did people lose skills during the pandemic? Did you know, young children and daters, did they lose some of that social interaction skill mm -hmm. um, that's part of being a social animal, being a, uh, being a social mammal? But at the other uh, side of that coin is that, yes, we, some of our social skills were challenged. I remember, I remember the first big event I went to, uh, and I thought, I just felt rusty. I don't know how to you know, walk, walk yeah. around the room anymore in the same yeah. way. Many of us felt that. But the other side of that coin is that we somewhat developed some new skills. And if you were in a relationship and living with someone, that could have, that looks like it, some of that was, you know, how do you talk through things? How do you, um, you know, if, you, if you're stuck in the house together, you don't want to fight for four days. So really kind of working, working through things. We don't know, to the question, it's a great question. We don't know whether that's going to be um, something that sticks with, with us, meaning, you know, sticks with America, sticks with people around the world. We don't have great data yet, long term. You know, that, that brings up, uh Another issue, this business of, we were so isolated for three years mm -hmm. um, that going into a social relationship in a group was a bit awkward. I know at the Commonwealth Club when we reopened and started having people come here, mm -hmm. um, for a while we had um, some of us volunteers kind of working to get people to talk to one another again. Mm -hmm. People were no longer in that habit. They were used to being at home watching the screen and so actually being here in a group where, you know, there are other club members and it's, hey, like, let's talk to one another mm -hmm. was something that had to get relearned. Uh, and one of the possibilities is that with what we're seeing with AI and, and you know, sex robots and God knows what, uh, will people not know how to relate to other human beings and, and all their messiness, their emotional messiness, their, their physical messiness, their boundaries, their, mm -hmm. you know, their, their touch and feelings and, oh, I mean, 
how are we going to deal with this? Or are people going to become avoidant from that and go, well, I'm going to <laughs> stick to my, you know, sex robot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at least, you know, yeah. I know how to deal with it and there's an off switch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we're seeing actually the rise of that. And actually some of our projects with, uh, with our mm -hmm. colleagues in informatics, we're seeing okay. how people are using intimate technologies and mm -hmm. intimate AI uh, and sex robots are on the rise. And you can get them from, you know, interfaces on your app that talk to you to a full, <laughs> you know, five foot doll that you bring mm -hmm. home with the eyes that open and close. Uh, they're quite expensive. Um, so, but people are buying them. And um, I, I uh, even in this, I'm, I'm still, I'm always optimistic, Eric, and I, I am not convinced that um, we can totally lose that. And I think that's in some ways part of our evolutionary history. We have the architecture for social connection. People around the globe um, do remarkable things for love, the pursuit of love, the search for love, and including in that uh, sex and sexuality. It's so much part of who we are uh, as a species. And throughout human evolutionary history, there have been moments that um, there have been plagues, there have been um, famine, there have been uh, wars, there have been, we haven't really lost that uh, desire for connection. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we can get rusty after being you know, away from it for a while, and we could be kind of messy and not sure, do we hug, do we kiss, do we, um, I actually think we're slowing down. And some of our data we found um, close to, uh, uh, more people have like a three date rule. So we found that 70% uh, said that of Americans in our sample said they wouldn't have sex on the first three dates. Mm -hmm. um, or people, many people don't even want to kiss on the first date, right? And they kind of, but they, but then they want it to happen between two and three dates uh, <laughs> to show that it's, you know, intimate, wow. not just a friendship. Right, right. And so, but there are these sort of rules that people are giving themselves again. And um, there is a little bit of a distance, right? So we crave this connection, but we're a little bit cautious about when we, touch and how we touch and whether that's just you know shaking hands or hugging or kissing or having sex with each other so there's a there seems like there's a little bit more distance and it's a little bit paradoxical we're craving more connection but we're being a little bit more cautious about having those connections um, so i think even though we're seeing this rise of technology that help are filling some voids in many people's lives um, i don't think it's going to replace those deep those deep human aspects of wanting um, yeah. romantic and um, sexual bonds. Yeah, 10 years ago, I have a note to myself here. Yeah. Y you said in a talk there were more <laughs> spontaneous hookups for sex than there were dates, that mm -hmm. people were beginning to have sex first, mm -hmm. and then they would think about, you know, do I want to form a relationship? Mm -hmm. And so you're saying in a sense that that may be backing off from that now. Yeah. That, that may be reversing. Yeah, this is a great timeline. I love it. This is, so that's exactly what we're starting to see. So that early, early on, my colleagues and I looked at studies of when things like hookups and casual sex were turning into relationships. I remember in one of our studies, more than half of men and women said they engaged in casual sex with the hope that it would turn into a romantic relationship. Boy. And exactly. It was for a sample of young people, college students. But in a national sample, we found that one in three people have had a one night stand or a friends with benefits that turned into a relationship. So that's not one in three events, but one in three people at some point have had that happen. So it's not necessarily a great strategy, but it was a strategy that for a lot of people, that these casual encounters were a way that um, to get to know someone, right? To sort of, uh, and you learn a lot about someone in a sexual event. You learn if they're hygienic, if they're funny, if they're caring, right. if they're passionate. You learn a lot of sensory information. So for some people that was starting relationships, but we're seeing- <laughs> Do they this, fall asleep instantly? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we know that sexual responses, there's a physiological cascade mm -hmm. of dopamine, of oxytocin that can help with bonding. Um, maybe whether you wanted it or not. And it's, um, right. but, but what we're seeing is that, I, I think what we're seeing is a, is a trend in our, in our data. Now that we're getting a few more years out, we're seeing data before the pandemic, in the pandemic afterwards, of a little bit more attention to building connection, a little bit more attention to dating, to taking dating a little bit slower. Um, so it's not that people are not still having casual sex and having hookups, they are, but people seem to be more um, careful and attentive if they're dating, saying, well, right now I'm in this space. I'm trying to build a connection. And even if I might have casual sex in other contexts, if I'm dating, seven out of 10 are saying, I don't wanna have sex right away. I wanna really build this Maybe connection Maybe back first. to your point at the very beginning of this, mm -hmm. of this uh, session about how people under times of stress are looking for someone who is mm -hmm. a partner. Yeah, exactly. Not just looking for you know, some way to forget just mm -hmm. today, you know, to, and tomorrow we shall die. Yeah. <laughs> but 
can I form some sort of a reliable partnership? Mm -hmm. And that's coming to the fore. And that, actually, I got an interesting question here. Um, so with this business about having sex and then seeing if you want a relationship, mm -hmm. well, in virtual life, you could do that too. Mm -hmm. You could do you know, mutual masturbation over Zoom or something. Yeah. Are people doing anything like that? Does that actually yeah. exist? Um, so yes, it does actually. And what we're seeing, and actually it was one of the interesting things that we saw with, with the pandemic, there were those declines in sexual frequency and desire, but it was also self-desire. So people were not engaging in uh, behaviors like masturbation. So that actually was quite interesting from a scientific perspective huh. because it suggested that it wasn't just that you were afraid of disease with someone else or because you could get infected with a COVID or, or it was that there was a genuine decrease in the desire that there were there sort of um, because I think we were in this sort of fear state. So we know that people are using these technologies in all sorts of ways. There's been a rise of also sex toys that couples can use where you can control them electronically. So when we think about things like long distance relationships, um, several movies have sort of had these on uh, called the teledildonics is the oh technical boy. term, yeah, yeah. Um, but that people can use them remotely. Um, it's, it's not totally different from the age of phone sex, right, from decades past. But how people are using technologies to connect, same if you're sending images to each other or video chatting. And I think um, I am, I'm a kind of of two minds. It does come at a risk. And we know that. We found in one of our studies that people who engage in sexting behavior, close to a quarter um, of people have uh, shared a sex with others, with their friends, often with their close friends. Um, and uh, with men in particular with three or more friends when they share wow. it. So there is a real risk of engaging in sexting. At the same time, part of what happens in budding relationships is vulnerability. So as you're building a connection with someone, as you want to elevate that, part of what happens is you're vulnerable with each other. So if you're in a relationship and you're traveling, taking that risk and saying, well, I sent you this image or engaging mm. in this erotic chat with each other, um, it feels kind of risky. You maybe would share that. You maybe would tell people. What if you had a screenshot? What if you shared the image? So for some people, that actually can build a deeper connection. And then for other people, it can be embarrassing and, and be so painful because the image gets shared. But that's the messiness of our intimate lives. We take all sorts of risks with each other with the hope that being vulnerable with someone else can make us feel really um, an intense bond with each other, a degree of safety when going gets tough. So those are the kinds of calculations we all make in our intimate lives. Is that lives. kind of behavior affected by age cohorts or, or different groupings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. On the sex thing we were at, we asked in one of our analyses, in one of our studies, we asked people of all sorts of different um, ages. And as you might guess, that digital sexting mm -hmm. happens with younger ages. But then as people got older, we also saw that certain age groups engaged in uh, emailing, uh, you know, uh, erotic messages to each other. Or um, I remember in one study, we also got information from people and they said, well, I leave, I used to have Polaroids that we would leave of each other mm -hmm. um, that were certainly included the face and that they could be um, you know, shared with others. So we did see across age cohorts that people were doing this um, as a way to sort of connect. And for some, it was a way to spice up a relationship. If you travel a lot on business, maybe it was a way to stay connected. But it doesn't mean it doesn't have risks. Um, it, for some people, that excitement has drew them closer together. And for others, it was really challenging. Yeah, you know, public sex in, some, in a certain kind of way. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, actually, one of the worries that a, a friend of mine had mentioned was that Maybe some of this, you know, electronic sex or you know, AI sex, whatever, might encourage people to think that sadistic behavior, masochistic behavior, is acceptable. Mm -hmm. They see this in porn. They get some AI robot that you know was agreeable to anything as long as you don't hit the off switch. Mm -hmm. You know, and how do they? You know, if they're teenagers, twenty something, and then they land in a real relationship later, and they don't know how to make the transition. Mm -hmm. In effect, they could be trained for good by AI, and they could also be trained for bad. And yet, I, I don't see any way in which you could be regulated. I mean, what are your thoughts about 
about that possibility. I, uh, this has been so on my mind with my um, colleague, Dr. Jessica Hilly at the Kinsey Institute who runs our education mm -hmm. programs. We've really been thinking about this gap in education and knowledge about sexuality. Where are people going to today to get information that's accurate, that's scientific, that's uh, ethical? Mm -hmm. And we do know from some of our studies that a lot of people are getting a sex education from things like pornography or what they find on the internet. And the challenge is, um, you can find a lot of great things on the internet, but as we know, the challenge is how do you curate that? How do you go through that information and maybe you go on and you learn something in pornography. You want to try something. It excites you. It arouses you. I don't think it's necessarily all bad. That's a, per very, that's a deeply personal decision for how someone wants to engage with erotic materials. But what my concern as a scientist and educator is, is that if you're turning to things like pornography as your source of information, if you watch a video and you see people you know, um, screaming and ripping the sheets and having sex for an hour, and that's what you think a sexual event is, that's not necessarily, people, in people's real lives, sex can be funny and messy and smelly and uh, complex. And, and where do we teach people that reality of, of what it can look like in your lives? And uh, in studies that colleagues at my University of Texas did many years ago, over 200 reasons why people had sex at their last event. Sometimes because they love the person, sometimes because they hate the person, sometimes <laughs> to make up after an argument. And those realities, those challenges in our lives. So one of the things we've been interested in doing at the Kinsey Institute is really ramping up thinking about our education programs and saying, where, do we, where can we be a, a source of accurate information? And where can other places be a source of accurate information? Um, and one of the things you brought up, and particularly about aggression, we know. Um, so we're seeing increasing rates of things like choking during, mm -hmm. um, particularly most studied, I think, in heterosexual intercourse, that uh, non-consensual choking. So people are learning sexual scripts. They're engaging in a sexual event. Now, some people like choking for things like erotic asphyxiation. There's some evidence that holding your breath can make orgasm feel more intense. So that's a particular type of sexual behavior that arguably needs some practice. Mm -hmm. um, but people are engaging in things like BDSM. Actually, there was a lot of interest after kind of Fifty Shades of Grey. There were, um, there were some reports there were more people ending up in the hospital from oh, injuries, from sexual events, um, because they were hearing things and wanted to try them. And on the one hand, I think it's great that people are being expansive and experimental in their intimate lives. But we also need to give people um, accurate information about, OK, if you want to try things like BDSM, turns out that people who practice it, they have best practices. Have a safe word. Make sure you know what each other's limits are. Make sure you know what you are consenting to and what you're not consenting to ahead of time. So really helping people sort of digest through that. I think it's so important. Um, we also see, so I mentioned things like choking in sex, particularly young people. We see very high rates of young people saying that they've on college campuses, they've had sexual events, usually in heterosexual contexts, men choking women, um, but not having a conversation about it. If that's something you want to do, OK. Um, but you should really talk to your partner about, about it beforehand. And we've had seen reports of people who passed out during sex because their partner, they didn't know their partner was going to choke them. They hadn't signed up for it. They weren't sure if they should say yes or no. The whole we business just, of consent and having to, yeah. to deal with you know, in a much broader view of what consent means than, you know, 10 years ago was, do you want to have sex or not? And now it's, you know, what flavor of something you may have seen on the internet that I didn't even know existed, you're going to try and do to me. Yeah. And you know, what, what's going on here? Yeah. And so the education has to step up yeah. to a large extent. And give, give education to give people the tools to even have those conversations. Like, what are we going to do tonight? What are we not going to do? What are, what are, what are my boundaries? What are yours? Um, and people sometimes worry those conversations can be buzzkills, mood killers. Actually, the evidence suggests that they can often be quite erotic. They can actually make experiences feel safer and more enjoyable, more pleasurable. <laughs> so a chapter in the education, <laughs> how do you introduce your 15-page discussion of what my boundaries are, yeah. becomes one of the things one teaches, I suppose. Yeah, and just to, and to be able to articulate it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, so many people have such a dearth of information mm -hmm. and education yeah. that's accurate that we don't even know how to articulate what it is that our interests and our concerns and our fears and our excitements are. Um, so helping people with those with those twos. We just published a paper with my colleague Michelle Druin in, um, in sexual medicine, uh, and it was looking at injuries from people that engage in sex, things like bruises, 
stickers or cuts or choke marks because people are experimenting in those things and often um, and, and often it's developing into forensic issues in terms of um, the, the marks and injuries people have from they trying things like BDSM. Right, they see it on, on the video, and they, do, they but in the real video, there's actually somebody off the set who's a consultant about this, and yes. there, <laughs> there's, you know, medical help, and there's, yeah. and then there's somebody applying makeup, and there's somebody, yeah, and you fans, know, and spray fan bottles. And, and, right, <laughs> right, they don't see any of this, yeah. and they, you know, they're 18. Yeah, 16, what do they, they don't yeah, know where, where do, what do you I'm do? getting a, a question from sure. a, a person who's a high school sex education teacher mm -hmm. saying, are you seeing differences um, between straight couples and, and queer couples? Mm -hmm. You know, in, 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 I suppose uh, they mean in, in terms of what education has to be. Yeah. And I can imagine someone isolated in the middle of somewhere where they're surrounded by people who... Yeah, I wouldn't talk to them about it. Exactly, and I love that, that someone, thank you for the person who wrote this question. Mm -hmm. And so we do know, one of the things we look at is when we think about sex and sexuality or the diversity of identities and experiences. Um, so my colleagues at the Institute famously, actually it was 25 years ago, they did these studies on what does it mean to have sex? And would you say you had sex if? Um, and if for those who can do the math, it was a particular political time of people were really questioning, um, you know, uh, is a particular behavior count as sex? Was oral sex sex? Is petting sex? Is, um, and it turns out that across sexual orientations, that is one area that it could matter. So we might say, did you have sex? The behavior you think you're describing might be quite different for a heterosexual person or couple or triad versus um, a, a gay man or a lesbian woman, that the very behaviors they engaged in might be different, even if they identified what they just did as having had sex. That has implications huh. for um, pu public health interventions, how we teach people about things like condom use and prophylaxis and sexually transmitted infections. We have to be inclusive in the language of how we're uh, sharing information and how we're helping young people in particular, but to be honest, people of all ages be safe in terms of their sexual practices. The reason I say people of all ages is because the two highest rates of sexually transmitted infections in America are the young ages, I think 18 to 24, and ages uh, 55 and older. Uh, and in fact, there's been a couple of case report studies of things like retirement communities mm -hmm. having very high rates of sexually transmitted infections, um, in part because people are sometimes not thinking about pregnancy. So they're right, not thinking right. about condoms. And at the same time, they're not thinking about, because they're not thinking about pregnancy, but also because with increasing age, there can be a reduction in sensitivity. So sometimes not using condoms is in order to feel the experience more. Oh, okay. so, so you can be at higher risk. So we have to talk about this. And I think whether it's in high school or whether we're talking to people in uh, senior citizen communities of all ages, we need accurate information. Um, so, and the other part of that question is, one of the things we see is that sometimes queer populations actually are a little bit better informed about sexual health. And one of the things that researchers think are happening, it's because if you're um, queer, and particularly for youth in the United States, you don't always have great places to go. So those populations some are sometimes using uh, the internet more often just to find information, to be in places that people are talking about sexual and gender diversity and sexual health. So actually, I think we have a lot to learn um, uh, in both in good and bad ways. The good way being that people are hungry for information and they don't have it in their local areas too often. But also that, again, if we're not helping curate that, if we're not giving people the skills of what to find that's accurate, um, that, can, that can really be risky. Well, I mean, maybe some of the things that educators have learned in the gay community mm -hmm. could then be expanded and, you know, this is how you teach mm -hmm. consent. This is how you teach topics that the heterosexual community has not been really dealing with overtly until recently. Yeah, exactly. And I think in particularly the history of, I mean, that was largely when we think about the impact of HIV AIDS, that um, right. people sometimes forget the enormous impact that had, particularly on the gay community, but in ways of having to reconcile thinking about sexual behaviors and sexual well-being. Interestingly, if they, I, they had to discuss their boundaries um, be, because otherwise they might get a, a deadly disease. Exactly. And, and I think that that also challenged then one of the things researchers, my colleagues in gender studies would say is what that ended up doing unintentionally, though, is that too often when we talk about gay men's sexual lives today, we think about it in the context of HIV and, and sexual risk. Hmm. So that so much of the knowledge in the last 20 years about differences between straight couples, gay couples, lesbian couples, 
have been because the only research that was funded on sexual orientation was about HIV reduction. Okay. So that we have this real bias that most of what we know about gay men's sexual lives is in the context of sexual risk. And right, HIV, illness, yeah. yeah, and HIV. But the other thing I will, just to give a shout out to some of my Kinsey Institute colleagues, in the 1980s, early on, everyone talking about HIV was really thinking about, um, they were immunologists. And mm -hmm. actually at the Institute, we held some really important workshops thinking about the role of sex in HIV and AIDS. And today we might take that for granted, but it's one of the things, I think it's why conversations like this, being open and willing to talk about sex and sexuality. So to think for a moment that the start of conversations around HIV, a disease that in disproportionately impact a sexual minority group, and that was sexually transmitted, and for the first few years, no one wanted to talk about the role of sex right. in HIV and AIDS. So it's why when I think about the work we do at the Kinsey it is so important, it's to really say there are times that we need to insert accurate information around sex and sexuality in, into the conversation. Sometimes it's a disease, sometimes it's how we're getting out of COVID, sometimes it's how we're gonna keep our marriages going. Um, but the, it's such a central part of our lives and all its different flavors that we have to um, find that the courage and that inspiration to just talk openly and honestly about love and sex in our lives. Right. Okay, we have another question here. Um, what's the difference in, um, oh, interesting, apps after the pandemic compared to before the pandemic? One of the things that I think is so um, neat, and I love uh, for those that know, we're, you know, we're sitting in San Francisco, right? This um, mecca for uh, mm -hmm. developers and using technology. and. Um, one of the things that was so interesting to me as a, you know, as a boring biologist in my laboratory was that uh, how quickly technological innovation happened with the pandemic and, and in many ways in service to our romantic and sexual lives. So with the pandemic, we saw that even though we knew beforehand like low rates of things like video chatting, almost all of the apps introduced ways to engage in video chatting and remain on the platform. So you didn't have to jump oh, to another okay. app or another device to do it. So that we saw a lot of innovation. I think the other thing that's happened, um, at least in some of our projects with Match, but I think a lot of them, is a lot of the apps and websites are using more behavioral science and part of that is sometimes slowing down. So one of the challenges with the apps is it's what we might call cognitive overload. It's too much information. There's too many pictures. You start to swipe rapidly. And what we really, um, what would benefit people if they're interested in making a connection is slowing down picture profile information, picture profile information, um, to sort of really think about a possible connection with someone. So a lot of the apps in the last few years have been using more behavioral science to try and make the experience more enjoyable for people, to sort of get them to slow down, to get them to read a profile, to think about what it is that they actually want, to expand, I think just what we were talking about earlier, to expand from their initial preference. Um, so, so there's two part, two answers to that. One is there have been technological innovations um, that our tech friends have made in terms of how we interface with the apps and the websites. But then the other is also integrating more behavioral science. And I think we have to do more and more of that. Okay, well, we are running out of time. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank Dr. Garcia for being here. And with that, we close with the hundred, what is it, 120 years Wonderful. of discussion here at the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>